Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, welcome to ICP. We're going to have an interesting uh, uh, forum today. The leading liberals, question mark, EU-Japan relations under the new partnership agreement. Um, it is an extremely important issue because, as we've seen, it's been all this discussion about if liberal values has gone and all that. And it's interesting to see Japan and Europe is actually cooperating much more. And that actually, in that sense, I would like to make slight advertisement also for uh, an upcoming event uh, on uh, 3rd of April, also 3 o'clock at the Stockholm School of Economics. Uh, then we're going to speak about EU-Japan trade agreement. What are the implications? So that will be the other side of the EU-Japan cooperation. So this is something I do recommend you to attend as well. So that will be on the April 3rd. But, so this is actually somewhere we see much more cooperation between um, Japan and European Union. And of course the trade agreement is the biggest trade agreement the European Union has entered. So then the question for me now is what the new partnership agreement, what that does extend to, what are the implications of this. And we have uh, the ambassador, Hiroki-san. He's going to start uh, giving an introductory word. And um, he will then take a few questions afterwards. And he, apart from being in Sweden, he just came from before Sweden, South Africa, and before that, uh, at the protocol, head of the protocol department in um, Tokyo. And I hope you're not going to be keeping the protocol. I hope that it will be challenging. So, Mr. Ambassador, I'll give you the floor and to start with uh, your presentation. Thank you very much, uh, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. It is a great honor for me to address you at the ISPP Forum on Japan EU Economic Partnership Agreement and Strategic Partnership Agreement. I would like to thank ISPP for holding this forum in such a timely manner. Japan EU EPA have just entered into force on February 1st this year. Some of the provisions of the SPA have also been applied. Today, I would like to touch upon the major significance of the equally important two agreements. Actually, it took five years for the agreement, agreements to be settled, so I can keep on talking about five years, but I want to keep it short. And uh, maybe you prefer to hear about Brexit, but uh, I will try to focus on EPA. Uh, because uh, Sweden is benefiting greatly from this uh, new agreement between Japan and EU. The number of Swedish companies that export to Japan is 2,784 companies. And the share of EU companies exporting to Japan that are small and medium sized, small and medium sized, are 83%. So it's not a story of big giant uh, IKEA or H&M, but it's all uh, smaller or medium-sized companies that are going to benefit greatly from this, uh, this agreement. And also in Sweden, the number of jobs in, in involved with this transaction between Japan and Sweden or Japan EU exports, the Swedish involvement here is number 15,298. So quite a few people are directly involved and benefiting from this uh, trade agreement. And <coughs> That's why we would like to uh, talk about it and let people know that this is a very forward-looking development. Uh, personally, I think uh, it's uh, more forward-looking than Brexit. 
Now, the first way, the EPA is a politically important and strong message to the world. The world has been witnessing the momentum of protectionism. Fighting against such trend, Japan and the EU will lead the world as a standard bearer of free trade and continue to firmly maintain and further develop the multilateral trade order. The EPA is, however, not just about free trade. It is also based on the fundamental values shared by Japan and uh, <coughs> EU countries. Our co commitment to democracy, belief in uh, open markets, respect for human rights, and the rule of law are stu stipulated on the agreement. With the EPA, our already existing good relations will be raised to a next higher level. Now, uh, you can sort of uh, now imagine the impact of this EPA uh, because uh, Japanese economy is said to be stagnating for the last 20 years. But actually, the truth is, it's growing steadily, small percentage of growth each year, but it's becoming bigger. Okay. Japanese uh, GNP, GDP is 4.8 trillion dollars, US dollars. Uh, 4.8 trillion dollars is a massive chunk. So if you take just 1% of it, it's still a big, big increment. So 1.8, of 1.8 trillion is 480 billion US dollars. So each year, Japanese economy is producing 800 uh, 480 million US dollars. Okay. Just think of the economy of Belgium. The whole GDP of Belgium is 493 US dollars. Okay. Think of Thailand. The whole Thailand is a big country, but economically, the whole GDP of Thailand is 455 million US dollars. So every year, every year, not just this year, last year, but every year, Japan is creating one Belgium, one Thailand, one Belgium, one Thailand every year. So that is the uh, impact of one percent growth of Japanese economy. Now, not to mention potentially economic benefits from the EPA are tremendous. The EU and Japan collectively account for 30% of the world GDP and 40% of the world trade. The combination of the two means the emergence of one of the largest trade arenas in the world. The EPA addressed a variety of issues for further trade liberalization between the two sides. Most remarkably, uh, tariffs were reduced to almost zero on both sides. The EU removed 99% of its tariff lines, and uh, Japanese industrial goods are all free of tariffs, 100% tariff free. Japan also took its significant efforts to eliminate non-tariff barriers by adjusting to international standards in a wide range of fields. I believe that more than 2,500 Swedish companies currently exporting to Japan are delighted about this. I hope that the agreement also encourages new export and investment into Japanese market and vice versa. Now you know the size, but then 
item by item, you will find it very interesting uh, to know what can happen in the coming years. Uh, the most familiar item is wine and cheese and other food processed materials. Now, uh, wine, uh, we are producing wine in Japan, but many Japanese wine lovers are going to uh, taste French, Italian, Spanish, German wine uh, at a lower cost. And then cheese, we import cheese from Sweden and uh, France, Italy, and some other EU countries, and cheese will be also tariff-free uh, in some years. Uh, what else? Pasta, chocolates, candies, biscuits. Now you find fat Japanese. <laughs> uh, the fishery and uh, forest products we also import, and we import greatly from Nordic countries, some from uh, Norway, and uh, and uh, logs from uh, Sweden. And then, of course, uh, the automobiles. Uh, it will be easier for European companies to export to Japan. Uh, not because of the tariff reduction, but because of the uh, freer inspection and freer regulation for European uh, automobiles. <coughs> and then this is not just tariffs. It's about uh, of other kinds of uh, benefits benefit for the trade-related activities. Uh, it's stipulated uh, intellectual property or the uh, labeling. You don't have to change the labeling. Uh, it is cumbersome if you have to change the, these small levels on your clothes to change it into Japanese. And also many telecommunication uh, regulations are eased to fit the needs of uh, the exporters and importers. Uh, financial services and uh, electronic uh, commerce become much easier to conduct. Yes, uh, I can go and go on and on and on, but I cannot help but mention one last item, that's beer. Beer will be beer in Japan. Actually, it was not categorized beer in Japan, it was categorized as a sort of sparkling, bubbling wine, bubbling uh, alcohol. Now it's called beer in Japan. So you can sell beer in Japan. No, no need to be afraid of calling it beer. And, and so, uh, if I keep on talking about the individual items, they don't have time to <laughs> share their ideas. So I'm going to stop with the, with the final um, discussion is about SPA, Strategic Partnership Agreement. The SPA is equally important to the EPA. The world is growing uh, uncertain and it is therefore essential to have partners to work mutual interests and tackle global challenges together. The EU are already good partners we share values like democracy, the rule of law, and human rights, fundamental freedom. On top of it, the SPA serves as a legally binding foundation to promote the strategic partnership. 
between the two sides in more than 40 areas of our mutual interests, like uh, environmental issues, or helping the developing countries, or education, cultural exchanges, energy and transport issues, science and technology, innovation, anti-terrorism activities, uh, massive uh, cooperation with the EU. With the EPA and SPA as a major step forward of uh, economic and political cooperation, Japan and the EU will continue its efforts to strengthen uh, cooperation and contribution and contribute to the safety and prosperity of mankind. Ladies and gentlemen, I look forward to fruitful and lively discussions during the forum. Thank you very much. So we will have an opportunity to have one or two questions. And I'm going to say this, and that goes for the panel as well. Keep in, Identify yourself. Keep the questions short and concise. If you need to lecture about the question, you have a, probably not thought it through. Think it one, think it over again, and then uh, answer the question. But uh, one or two questions uh, to the ambassador. Anyone who wants to? Yes. yes. Uh, Richard C. from Sintrain. Uh, um, ambassador, uh, I'm not very, uh, in fact, I'm a little bit confused. Uh, would you please comment a little bit about the EPA, EPA and SPA, and uh, say, give me some example of what is the difference, not what is the common, what is the difference. So the difference between practical examples on the difference between EPA and SPA. Oh, 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 oh. Very, very easy. Uh, SPA is strategic partnership agreement. So that covers uh, mainly political cooperations between EU and Japan. So the items that is stipulated in SPA are, uh, as I said, uh, cultural exchanges, sports activities, education, immigration, money laundering, legal cooperation, uh, health care, uh, energy issues, <coughs> climate change, environment, space cooperation, tourism, science and technological in innovation, disaster prevention, anti-terrorism, chemical weapons, and uh, um, crisis management, peace building. So these political issues, we work together with EU. And then EPA, that's SPA. EPA is based on economical, economic issues. So we reduce tax, but uh, on top of reducing tax, we take care of trade-related issues, such as uh, uh, inspection of the quarantine, I mean the diseases, and uh, the uh, government procurement. There's a stipulation about antitrust <coughs> regulations or subsidies or the national enterprises, how they go for bidding and uh, transparency of the corporations and uh, conflict uh, or settlement of disagreement. These are all stipulated in EPA. So EPA trade related economical agreement, the SPA strategic partnership, all other cooperation 
between EU and Japan, mainly political components. Anyone has uh, any quick question, uh, more additional to this? Or should we let the ambassador off the hook? <laughs> well, uh, Ambassador Hiroki, thank you very much for this uh, introductory remarks, and uh, let's give a hand for the ambassador. Well, now we have three uh, very good panelists. Uh, we're going to start out with uh, Dr. Katharina Ingberg, who is the senior advisor with the Swedish Institute for European Policy Studies, CIPS. She's also, before that, she uh, was at the Defense, Department of Defense, responsible for Asia. So she has a combination here between Europe and Asia, and I think that's the strong point. Then we have Dr. Marie Söderberg, who is the director for European Institute of Japanese Studies at the Stockholm School of Economics. It's so much easier to just call it Handels. <laughs> and then uh, finally we have uh, Dr. Lars Varje, who is heading the Stockholm Japan Center at the ICP, formerly, among other things, the ambassador to Tokyo. Uh, so I would like uh, Dr. Katharina, Katharina Engbeck to start. The floor is yours. Thank you very much for, for having me here and to participate and learn from the discussion that will evolve. Um, it is interesting to note then that after a protracted period of negotiations between Japan and the European Union, suddenly we have a flurry of agreements coming, uh, coming, uh, uh, being ready and signed. And there are of course some obvious reasons for why we have this intensification of the uh, uh, Japanese-European relationship. And uh, let me mention a few of them, the most important uh, in my mind. The first is the United States revoking uh, the tra several, several trade agreements. It's the TTIP, it's the TPP, uh, which Japan has tried to pick up and assume sort of leadership role in Asia for, for <laughs> assembling again a, a sort of a free trade agreements in, in the Asian sphere. Um, the, uh, um, also the fact that the U.S. has, uh, has uh, left the Paris Agreement on climate change. Uh, so it's the uncertainty of, about the uh, role of the United States, its traditional role of upholding the liberal order, in this case in terms of the trade relationship ships. But we also should add to the analysis the growing geoeconomic and, uh, and uh, geopolitical influence of China. Uh, which forms the other background, uh, main background element in my mind to this flurry of agreements between Japan and, and the European Union. Um, it is the growing sense of growing pressure uh, on um, uh, the formation of uh, sort of an, an, an anti-liberal sort of emergence of dimensions which is reflected in with regard to trade but also in terms of security, uh, where both the European Union and Japan feel that they need to join forces in order to uh, address this, this other new element of, uh, of uh, global affairs and international affairs. And I think it's important to understand this wider context. And uh, just to give you an example, for those of you who want to, uh, to uh, deepen your your studies in this uh, regard. Uh, I wanted to point to a new document for the European Commission that was prepared in view of the European Council of the European leaders that was held on Thursday and Friday, which was of course uh, completely overwhelmed by Brexit, but also had some other important points of its, uh, on its uh, agenda. And one was the discussion on this document, EU China, a strategic outlook. Uh, this is an interesting document because it uh, it, uh, it, it's a detailed document that out, outlines all the changes the European Union has to undertake in terms of its single market, for example, procurement rules, uh, sort of standards, important standards for the European Union, which are sort of the result, these changes, and the screening mechanism, which is the most important uh, aspect of this, uh, these new elements to the European Union-China policy. But these are all changes that result from the growing, the rise of China and its growing geopolitical and geoeconomic uh, importance. So I wanted to, to point to this 
So in, this, in view of this more contested world, uh, where alliances and, and uh, agreements are not the same on the liberal side and where you have contenders uh, on the other side, uh, the European Union and Japan has found it important to stabilize uh, sort of the middle level of the global system under the huge, big um, national actors, China and the United States, and find an agreement uh, with regard to free trade, but also with regard to uh, the liberal values. And the two documents some symbolize the two uh, aspects of, uh, of this uh, ambition. Uh, also with regard to the European Union, if you want to look into the document, there is another called EU Asia Connectivity Strategy that was uh, testifying in general also to the growing importance of Asia, which of course is a third element that should be mentioned uh, when you try to outline the background to, uh, to these agreements. The ambassador already uh, uh, described the, um, the uh, importance of the economic partnership agreement. Um, it went into force on the 1st of February. Uh, simultaneously, the uh, strategic partnership agreement went into force, but in a provisional manner, because the strategic partnership agreement has to be ratified by member states of the European Union, so that's sort of a lengthy process, it will take time. But there is a, a provisional implementation of the uh, SPA as well. Um, with regard to the EPA, the interests are obvious. This creates the largest free trade uh, zone in the world. And I think it's important to add the, um, the agreements made by Japan and European Union with regard to data flows, uh, which is in parallel. There has been uh, such new standards set by the European Union, the standards for free flow of, of secure data flows. And Japan has made similar um, uh, has had similar developments of its standard setting for what constitutes secure and free uh, data flows. And I think uh, this is a very important aspect to, to notify in terms of uh, uh, what, the, what the two parties are, are trying to build. Um, the two, uh, Japan and European Union, also to add another figure, they, Correspond jointly, they correspond in terms of development aid to 60% of, uh, of global development aid. So you can continue adding on to uh, figures and elements that testify to the importance of, of uh, these two actors in global, generally in global affairs. Uh, Japan and the European Union obviously want to set the standards for future trade agreements. It's not only about stabilizing in view of uncertainty where we have the United States on these matters, but it's also stabilizing the uh, standard setting. The European Union has been the main standard setter of, uh, of global trade, uh, very much emulated by other actors, China for example, uh, because it has this, if you want to have access to this huge market, you have to adhere to the standard set. Now, Japan and the European Union jointly want to secure the standard setting in this regard. The strategic partnership agreement, uh, the European Union has three such agreements. Uh, now with Japan, previously with uh, South Korea and Canada. Now the one that South Korea was concluded before the new Lisbon Treaty was uh, came into force in the European Union, which means there are some new clauses in the Lisbon Treaty that has been uh, applied to these sorts of agreement. For example, in the CETA agreement between Canada and European Union, you have an agreement on uh, an important aspect, um, which is the so-called essential element clause, uh, which means that uh, you can suspend the agreement in case one of the parties is violating human rights. Uh, and this, uh, this agreement, this element was not included in the agreement with South Korea because that was before, it's included in the Kana agreement, and it's a matter for negotiation between Japan and European Union, since, for example, Japan still applies capital punishment, which obviously to Europeans is not consistent with, with, uh, with uh, um, human rights. So these things are, this, this is an example of uh, sort of the frictions that still have to be sorted out in the relationship with Japan and European Union. Obviously, this is not a homogeneous relationship yet. And there's a lot of differences between Japan and European countries, but it's a matter, the two parties, if I put it that way, feels that they're confident that they, over time, will be able to, uh, to uh,
come to agreements on the successive uh, number of issues that they are still pending, uh, so to speak. Now the uh, SBA uh, contains, as the ambassador was mentioning, but let me just restate, security, which is important. You should look at this is an important element of the SBA. It's obviously not part of the EPA. Um, European Union and Japan has cooperated in terms of peacekeeping, other areas, uh, since a long time. But there is now a new element since the European Union takes an increasing interest in the security situation in Asia. Uh, it's obviously not a military power, two nations, the UK and France, who are Pacific military powers, but the European Union obviously is not, but it's taking an increasing interest in security, Asian security. And again, for the obvious reason, this is just a, a region of growing uh, importance. You have energy, disaster management, cybercrime, education, the, the, uh, the uh, common uh, challenge of an aging population, research and development, combating terrorism, climate change, etc., etc. But the agreement also forms the basis, the legal basis, for cooperation between Japan and the European Union in the international and regional fora. There is likely to be more coordination of position in terms of the way Japan and the European Union position itself in various international fora. And the parties uh, agree on promoting human rights, rule of law, rules-based international order, peace and stability across the world, etc., etc. But as I mentioned, I will conclude with this, there are still caveats, things still that have to be sorted out, the ratification process on the European side, and then the, uh, the meaning and the implication of the essential element clause that I have, uh, have uh, discussed previously. Uh, also the European Parliament, which also ha always has to agree on this sort of agreement, and it has already agreed on the uh, SBA uh, with Japan, uh, noticed in its comments that, uh, again, Japan still applies capital punishment. It has not ratified core ILO, International Labour Organization, conventions. Uh, the European Parliament th still thinks there are things to be discussed between Japan and the European Union when it comes to women's rights. Women's rights. So, uh, lots of things to discuss, but one good uh, sort of the uh, constructive interpretation of this is between uh, parties that have a basic understanding on things, uh, there is the opportunity to, uh, over time, uh, discuss and sort things, these things out. That's what multilateral cooperation is, is for in the end. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. It's a very interesting start, and I think that that pointed out a lot of the, the positive thing, but also I think the challenges, and the challenges, of course, is well, the devil is in the details, and I think we have a lot of details to sort out. Sure. But, uh, like I said, right? Yes. yes. Uh, we heard already a lot about the economic partnership agreement, and that one is very firm. It's in detail decided what we are going to do and not do. Uh, SPA is much more loose, actually. And my feeling is that this is the way uh, it has always been between EU or Europe and Japan. Economics has been going rather well, while politics have been very low. We have not cooperated very much. In I mean, we share the same values and so forth, but there hasn't been all that much of cooperation between EU and Japan in the field of politics. There has been a number of um, trials to get the relations going, and of course, after the, if I give short historical background, after the Second World War, uh, from 1952, again, uh, European countries started cooperating with Japan. And the formation of the EEC in 1957, uh, at that point, uh, Japan had a suspicion it would lead to a common external tariff rather than anything else. In Japan, uh, economic diplomacy is very important, and that's often how they interpret the surrounding. 1970s, we had a number of trade disputes. That was the area when the Japanese economy was growing so much, and we tried to protect ourselves here in Europe. But uh, uh, when the Berlin Wall fell, actually, relations really started taking off. And in 1995, 1991, we had something called the Hague Declaration. Uh, which proposed political 
cooperation between, e between at that time, EEC and Japan. It became some small cooperation, but it didn't really take off very much. There was an arms register institutionalized within the UN due to this, but no big political cooperation. Lukewarm relations in politics while economics was going forward. And then we had another uh, agreement in 2001, the so-called Action Plan, which actually listed 200 different items where EU and Japan should cooperate. At that time, um, the Japanese, I think, were a little bit afraid of something called Fortress Europe, that we would close the borders, and there was an interest, because Europe is also a big market, besides Japan being a big market. So they wanted to be inside the EU, and we should cooperate on a number of issues. But in 2001, we had also something else happening in September. Anyone remember? The attacks on the World Trade Center. <laughs> in New York, and that kind of uh, turned the focus against anti-terrorism combating rather than cooperation between the EU and Japan. Even if we have shared values and principles of democracy, rule of law, human rights and fundamental freedoms as our same normative <coughs> background. Um, I would also like to say, of course, that EPA and SBA hangs together. And um, as Catalina said already, <laughs> uh, one of the reasons they went forward was Trump in the US and his policy, where he started to uh, uh, say no to the trade agreements. He was going to conclude with both uh, the 12 countries in the Pacific, with Japan, the TTP, and with Europe, the TTIP. This kind of led the EU and Japan uh, to go forward with their trade agreement. And connected with this was also a strategic partnership agreement. This was, uh, I would say, driven from the European side. It was nothing that Japan was wishing. Uh, in 2011, I heard many voices, what is this? Uh, what do we need this one for? We don't have this agreement with anyone else, but the Europeans were pushing to have the strategic partnership agreement at the same time. Uh, of course, behind this, as you already said, rise of China, also <coughs> another issue. Japan needs friends, and so does the EU, actually, both politically and in trade issues. There is already some uh, cooperation going on in the defense area. For example, within the CSDP missions, we have had we've had uh, Japan also working with the uh, aid, cooperating in in Mali uh, and in Niger with building up a police academy and in Niger with radio communication for security reasons. We have also cooperation in the Gulf of Aden with so-called NAM4, uh, where uh, we combat piracy together. This has worked very well. Uh, still, I think also digital is one very important issue, and cooperation on cyberspace. This is very important. I think if we want to, the strategic partnership to go forward, we need to, in the present agreement, there are around 40 different items that are pinpointed. There is no way we are going to be able to start cooperation in all those. We need to pinpoint a few that are really important and where both of us can gain from cooperating. One of them is probably cyberspace and data security. This is very important for Japan, especially having the Olympics in mind next year, where they do not want any data attacks or any dealing with information. Um, Frederica Mogherini is actually in Japan right now. She was supposed to hold uh, a meeting with the uh, foreign minister Kono, but he was sick today. <laughs> Still, they're having the first meeting of the joint committee to work out 
discuss what of those 40 items that they might want to cooperate on and which are the most important ones. Uh, climate change is probably one. I will also pinpoint development cooperation. As you say, we have 60% of the development cooperation together. Now, uh, Japan will hold the G20 in the summer. Uh, and uh, they have a plan to present a new definition of how to define what is development cooperation. This should be highly of high interest to you this as well. They want a wider definition of development cooperation. And of course, this has to do uh, with uh, leaving the Millennium uh, Development Goals and going forward with the Sustainable Development Goals, which are much broader. Our old uh, definition of development cooperation is hard to use in this context, and they're trying to launch a new one that will be very exciting, I think. Uh, Another thing, although we have, um, we, we cooperate and we are willing to cooperate, but we are still both of us very dependent on the U.S. for defense, <laughs> I would like to point out. And this becomes very clear, uh, for example, uh, Japan in this year has no uh, resolution in UN, UN Con Council of Human Rights concerning human rights and North Korea, which they've had every year since 2007. Uh, now they're not putting forward a resolution here, but they will support the European one, they said. I think this is very interesting. Yeah. And, but also, why? Because they are leaving it open for some changes, maybe, according to North Korea. And in this sense, they're dropping the, the um, adoption issue, which they have put forward all the time. But now they are opening up for cooperation, as you say, but there's also slight change here, and I think they are taking US <coughs> considerations into this as well, rather than the wish to cooperate with the EU, to be frank. Um, yeah, maybe I should leave it there and I can come back during the question and answers and we can pick a few specific issues. I know you have a long yeah. presentation. <laughs> a long one? No, no. no. Uh, it's, it's only three minutes long. <laughs> no, no. Um, repetition is the mother of all learning, so I will repeat a, certain, a few things. Um, the SPA, the Strategic Partnership Agreement, consists of 51 uh, articles and uh, of those articles 40 or so are con concrete issues uh, like the cyber security and, and, and all these things that have been repeated uh, <coughs> it is in a way you can see the, the SPA as uh, a mini UN charter it deals with most everything and it can be filled with very concrete and, and very uh, very constructive uh, agreements and constructive cooperation between EU and Japan. But there are certain things that I think one, one certain of the, the articles that one can uh, look at that are very specific and, and uh, also creates uh, a few questions. And I'd like to, to uh, do that. The, um, first of all, the, the, you mentioned the, uh, uh, the joint committee. Joint committee uh, shall meet uh, once a year, uh, every other time in Brussels and every other time in Tokyo. It, mean, it, it can also uh, meet uh, when necessary, if one of the parties uh, uh, demands so. But most of all, I think it's a whole long list of political issues that point at the possibility of the EU and Japan together taking a very uh, forceful step forward uh, to defend liberal values uh, in, on the global scene. And I think that the challenge is really, will the European Union and will Japan stand up to this challenge? Can they actually do this when you take into consideration that th there is China, there is Russia, and now also we have to take 
look at the United States as one of the challenges. But let me just use the, um, uh, just a few articles and, and look at them and uh, start by reading the purpose of the SPA. It is quite important. <coughs> It's a welcome break. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we look, I can also bring it up. Yeah. Yeah, no, here it comes. Okay. So, <clears throat> the purpose of the agreement. This is. Uh, I know one should do it this way, you shouldn't put too much text on the PowerPoint, but anyway, I put it here so I can read it for you. A. Strengthen the overall partnership between the parties by furthering political and sectoral cooperation and joint actions on issues of common interest, including, including regional and global challenges. And here I would like to stress regional challenges. Uh, what are the regional challenges for Europe and what are the regional challenges for Japan? That has to be defined. And this, this creates opportunities, but it also creates uh, difficulties, I think, for both the EU and Japan. B, provide a long-lasting legal foundation for enhancing bilateral cooperation as well as cooperation in international and regional organizations and fora. Here again, regional uh, organizations. And what are they? When you come, when you look at Japan, what are the regional uh, organizations? Mostly they are bilateral uh, organizations or bilateral agreements. So there is a lot to do here also for if you want to cooperate on the regional uh, uh, arena. C. Contribute jointly to international peace and stability through the promotion of peaceful settlement of disputes in conformity with the principles of justice and international law. I think this uh, sentence here is aimed from the Japanese point. This is my interpretation at China. You have to, EU and Japan has to together underline the necessity to uh, conform with the principles of justice and international law. D, contribute jointly to the promotion of shared values and principles, in particular democracy, the rule of law, human rights, and fundamental freedoms. Again, uh, if it's not pointed or aimed at China, it will uh, be a, a, a sentence that can be pointed at China. It is something that is, of course, necessary, and it's something that we all, the, the values that we share, but it's important also to underline that if we are going to cooperate, Japan and, and the EU, this is what we have to base ourselves on. And two, in pursuance of the purpose set out in paragraph one, the parties shall implement this agreement based on the principles of mutual respect, equal partnership, and respect for international law. And here you can look at history. And it's very important if you look at, go back uh, to uh, uh, the Paris uh, 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 conference in 1919, you remember that <clears throat> there was uh, an, an issue with Japan not being treated as an e equal partner, and this led was one of the contributing factors to that Japan reacted as it did later on, and, 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 and uh, creating all the difficulties. So this is very important that we have mutual respect <coughs> and uh, equal partnership. <coughs> And also, the parties shall strengthen their partnership through dialogue and cooperation on matters of mutual interest in the areas of political issues, foreign security policies, and other sectoral cooperation. To this end, the parties shall hold meetings at all levels, including those of leaders, ministers, and senior officials, and promote wider exchanges between their people, as well as parliamentary exchanges. Here, I can hear the, the first two paragraphs, uh, two paragraphs just drop to the floor. This is UN language. This is something, okay, let's meet, let's talk about it. Uh, what shall we do? Well, the solution is that we talk about it, that we meet, that we have another resolution. This, of course, is necessary, but it also points at this being an, interna uh, an international 
agreement that resembles many other international agreements. So it's really a challenge to not only talk about cooperation, but do something with it. And there are all uh, a lot of uh, uh, possibilities. The Article 24, I will not read all this, but uh, it's on climate change. And here it is clearly pointed in a way as, as things are today. It's clearly pointed at the United States uh, because it, it underlines what we have agreed upon uh, in the Paris Agreement in, in, in 2015. And it, it underlines that this is what we have to follow. This is what we have to do. So it, it, it not on purpose, it points the finger in the eye uh, on the present uh, American government. And this one, Article 29, Maritime Affairs, in accordance with international law, as reflected in the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, done at Montego Bay on 10th December 1982, here and after referred as UNCLOS, and so forth. It underlines the importance of UNCLOS. And this also is, I think, very clearly necessary uh, as a basis to uh, deal with China uh, together, EU and Japan. Uh, they have a, a, an article here saying that they have to underline un the, the importance of, of UNCLOS and the uh, rule of, or the international, the rule of, of law and, and also international agreements. I will just mention a few more. <coughs> Cooperation on cyber issues. There's an interesting text. Uh, I will not read it. But uh, here it is also pointed at, at the situation as it is today, uh, meaning that we have countries like Russia, we have countries like North Korea, we have countries like China that are involved in, in cyber uh, issues or cyber crime uh, that we have to deal with uh, together. So this is also very important. It's not just an issue that is listed as one of the articles. It, it is actually something that is very concrete and very pointed if you really analyze uh, this article. But then you have some strange, this is the strangest uh, article that I've seen in any international agreement. The headline is Passenger Name Records. And of course, uh, if you read it, the parties shall endeavor to use to the extent consistent, consistent with their respective laws and regulations available tools, tools such as passenger name records to prevent and combat acts of terrorism and serious crimes while respecting the right of privacy and the protection of personal data. It is a strange title for an article, but it's also a very important article, meaning that we have to do some concrete things that in, perhaps is on the verge of, of, of going against uh, international law, but we have to somehow work together and make sure that we stay within the law, but also that we can use all the possibilities to, to get to the issues, namely to identify the terrorists when they uh, travel internationally. But then, <coughs> Article 39, the other was Article 37. This is the shortest, one of the shortest articles I've ever seen. The parties shall enhance cooperation with a view of ensuring a high level of, per of protection of personal data. Well, sure, yes, of course, we can all agree. But what does it mean? Uh, so I think the, the, um, the agreement uh, is um, a mixture of very concrete uh, articles, very concrete action plans, and very fuzzy uh, language that can, can mean anything. But perhaps this is necessary, I don't know. But you also have Article 10, if you go back to Article 10, uh, which is uh, headlined International and Regional Cooperation and Reform under the United Nations. This is a call for a UN reform. And both uh, the EU and Japan is, is uh, here saying that we would like to uh, look at the, the United Nations organization or the charter and do something about the present situation. We need to reform the UN. This, of course, is easier said than done, but it, it's necessary to have uh, in the SPA. And finally, 
Article 41. It's the, 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 the last article with concrete uh, content, and it's culture. And I am very much for underlining the importance of culture uh, in order to understand each other when you have two civilizations. If you don't understand culture, uh, you will go nowhere. Unfortunately, this is the last article. I would like to see an international agreement where the culture comes as the first article or a second article. Anyway, I'm glad it's here. Uh, I don't know what it will lead to other than that we will meet and we have uh, audiovisual works and, and such as films and, and so forth. But it's good that it's there, meaning that when you talk about politics, you also have to talk about culture, cultural cooperation. So, and, and that also goes back to the shared values that we have, shared values that we base our political cooperation on. Uh, and, and of course, culture is part of you, in my view, also of the political cooperation. Absolutely, the final, um, it's hard to read, but you, it's hardly, it's easy to see. Uh, I think it was uh, a general, a Japanese general, in about 100 years ago, or even more than that, uh, Yamagata Aritomo, who said that <coughs> we have to deal with Korea in a specific way because Korea is a dagger pointing at the heart of, of, of Japan. This was, of course, a, an exaggeration, but it was the, the, the mood of the time. But if you look at this, 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 uh, this map, <coughs> you have Vladivostok, uh, which is Russia, you have Pyongyang, which is North Korea, Seoul, with the present bilateral tensions between the ROK and Japan, you have Beijing, you have Shanghai, or Nagasaki, and Nanjing, all, all related to issues that are, are presently also on the table. And then you have territorial <coughs> issues with Russia, the Northern Territories, the Takashima issue with, with uh, Korea, and the Yaoi with, with China, showing that these difficult issues that all these daggers that are pointed at Japan need to be dealt with somehow in cooperation with someone, with the United States, but also with, with the EU. But it also shows that if the EU and Japan are going to cooperate also on regional issues, we have to be aware of where we stand and what we would like to support and where we stand when it comes to Russia, when it comes to North Korea, when it comes to China. So nothing is solved by this SPA, but it creates the foundation of possible cooperation, possible uh, <coughs> solutions, but also possible really difficult issues for, for us uh, uh, in the EU. So I'd like to th uh, thank you and, and, and stop the we can take questions. Okay, fantastic. Um, so I would uh, start with uh, allowing the the presenters to comment on uh, the presentations. I would like everybody to be as short as possible because we're running a bit over. But there's also one thing I would like to think about. It's 57 articles, 40 roughly, is rather concrete. But what is the main expectation of the EU and Japan? I mean, what, what is for the, for the strategic partnership agreement? Do we have different expectations? Uh, what do we really hope to get out of this? Is this more symbolic or do we actually want something concrete? And I assume in Europe it's a divided answer. I mean, I'm sure there's <laughs> different perceptions where, where you step in Europe. Uh, I hope we're all in agreement on how to deal with it, how to work with Japan, but I assume that's not the case. Maybe not in Italy at least. So, please, and uh, feel free to comment on what I'm talking with. Yeah, let me take two examples then uh, to answer, address the uh, last question you put. With regard to data protection, this is a very tricky issue. You don't solve it easily by in paragraphs. This requires protect, protect, uh, protected, protracted negotiations uh, between two parties, maybe regardless of whether they're China, European Union, or others. So in the APA, there is the paragraph, the 13th paragraph, with sort of details more what this is about. And there are some there are some considerable concrete uh, elements to uh, to these negotiations. So let me just read it out. Uh, um, uh, 
It says, with the EU General Data Protection Regulation that entered into force last year, and the new Japanese privacy law that entered into force in May, and that is 2018 then, the EU and Japan have modernized and strengthened their respective data protection regimes. In July 2018, the European Commission and the Japanese government reached a satisfactory conclusion on the robustness uh, of each other's data protection rules, and hence they intend to move forward with the adoption of a so-called mutual adequacy arrangement, which will create the world's largest area of safe transfer of data based on a high level of, of protection for personal data. I think this is extremely important, and the uh, European Union has been in the forefront when it comes to regulating uh, the protection of uh, uh, privacy issues re related to data. And there are other issues, of course, the taxation of big tech, etc., etc., but this is really at the core of regulation, you know, where the Europeans have been the first to react when it comes to uh, privacy protection integrity. And uh, I, assume, presume, I, I assume then that Japan sort of uh, is in the same line of, argue, of thinking, uh, that there is a common overlap of understanding. So this is an answer. There is an overlap of understanding, but these are extremely complicated things that need uh, protracted, protra protracted uh, series of uh, negotiations in order to hammer out exactly what this means. It's extremely technical and legal. But this is common interest. It requires more. Um, detailed agreement, but, but uh, I'm pretty sure it will happen, which will facilitate uh, combat of terrorism and all other sort of subsets of issues uh, that, that are related to this. And then and a comment on security to answer your main question, uh, uh, the common understanding. I think there is, uh, again, overlapping uh, interest, although interests are asymmetric. I mean, obviously, Japan and European <coughs> Union do not have exactly um, uh, 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 harmonized security interests. They have asymmetric uh, uh, interests because of their different positions in the world and, and history. But they do share their interest in the disputes over contested territories, for example, to be regulated according to international law. And, uh, and international law, as you know, doesn't predict exactly uh, to whom a specific territory or maritime or uh, land territory belongs, but it sets a pattern for negotiations over these issues. And UNCLOS, in terms of maritime matters, is, of course, uh, the main legal system uh, and that um, where Japan has an obvious keen interest to, uh, to uh, protect in, in Asia when it comes to St. Krakowia <coughs> Islands, uh, but also when it comes to the South China Sea and China's Dash 9 line, uh, and where the Charcoal Islands was submitted to the International Law of Arbitration and it ruled in favor of the Philippines. <laughs> and China immediately said, we don't care, basically. So. And uh, although the Europeans do not have any, any shows or any cliffs to defend in Asia, the principle of immensely important for the Europeans. And the European core interest here would be Crimea. You don't seize territory, they may be contested, but you have to have legal processes and, and uh, regulation for how you negotiate over these contested areas. And uh, Japan obviously has supported the European Union when it comes to Crimea, but it has also its own interest when it comes to the Northern Territories. It has to balance its negotiations between Russia and China on, on sensitive matters in this part of the world. So it's not totally overlapping, but there is some basic understanding on some core issues. So uh, that would be my answer. Anyone else want to start for? <laughs> No, I, I also want to follow up on this. In the, in the Philippine case, mm -hmm. uh, when the court ruled uh, mm -hmm. to the favor of the Philippines, mm -hmm. uh, EU started pointing this out mm -hmm. uh, and asking for concession from the Philippines. Mm -hmm. The Japanese were absolutely quiet. Mm -hmm. Not to move interests. In, 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 it was of their core interest, much more than the European, actually. Mm -hmm. But they were not willing to pursue it. 
further than what they did. Let me just comment. The China and Japan obviously has a dialogue on the Senkaku mm. Islands. Mm. There's been some crisis management, some sort of dialogue, yeah. and that's probably the priority of Japan. Yeah, I think so too. <coughs> and the same when it comes to us and it comes to Russia. We have certain interests where Japan has other interests. Mm -hmm. They're also interested in keeping good relations with Russia to counter China. So this is another, but that's like you said, we are in different different geographical locations, so of course there are differences. And uh, um, Japan also in the case of the, in the UK case of poisoning of this um, yeah, the Skripal case, Japan did not withdraw any people from the UK <coughs> as most other European countries did. So we have common normative values and so forth, but we act very differently. We apply differently. Yeah. Another thing which I think is important uh, for the EU now, and that's getting back to culture actually. <laughs> I think uh, Japanese culture has gained immensely in in Europe, everyone knows the uh, uh, manga and anime, and we have, can buy sushi in any supermarket nowadays. But Europe needs to spread its ideas, values, and culture among regular Japanese citizens. I think they don't know very much about Europe as such, to be frank and honest. And I think that is also one of the goals with a strategic partnership agreement, that they want to promote Europe in <coughs> Japan. And this is absolutely necessary, I would say. Still, if we go out in the streets, either in, in uh, Tokyo or in Stockholm, and ask anyone, what do you know about the strategic partnership between EU and Japan? No one knows anything. What is this? <laughs> They will ask. Free trade, they might have heard about it, but not the strategic <coughs> partnership agreement. But they like um, music. <coughs> Japanese. Yeah. Uh, you see, there, yeah. you know, they, so there is overlaps so and interest, common interest, mm. interest in each other cultures. Yes. Yeah. Mm. It is. But uh, yeah, anyway, I think uh, that should be one of the goals of Europe to go out mm. in a larger audience also and promote. I'll talk to that before we open up. And uh, just raise your hand and I'll mm -hmm. uh, I think the, the, this agreement shows that uh, Japan and the EU are really now two partners that are uh, facing uh, similar challenges. Uh, and even in those, challenges, in those challenges, I think we can include the present American government. So you have the, the USA, the China, and Russia as being something that concerns the EU, both the EU and Japan from various angles and, and where we at least could cooperate and, and in, in solving uh, whatever, I mean, free trade when it comes to uh, uh, the United States um, and the WTO and so forth, but, but also other challenges. So I think it's, it's a call for help in a way uh, that we need each other and we need to, uh, to work together in order to solve this, in order to save uh, the liberal world uh, order, and I think it's it's natural that EU and Japan cooperates. Uh, I think it also would be natural that uh, the Republic of Korea would, would be involved in this. But unfortunately, lately, uh, from the Republic of Korea, there have been some initiatives that have really uh, stirred the 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 pot in the wrong direction. I think, uh, but you have democracies in Asia. You have RFK, Japan, and Taiwan, and somehow they should be able to um, cooperate uh, in meeting challenges. But to begin with, Japan and, and the EU uh, are two fundamental pillars in, in uh, protecting the liberal world. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to have the, the panel's views and possibly also their pastors' views on uh, how you assess. Uh, the way in which the United States, or rather the Trump administration, is viewing what we have been talking about this, this afternoon, in the sense that here is a, a liberal uh, trade liberalization uh, effort, a major one, take, taking place, uh, and in the wake of that we have the, the new TTP on 
taken on the initiative of, 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 of Japan, and the United States is most probably feeling quite excluded, uh, and possibly are reviewing their own position. And what would be your take on how the Americans are reacting now? They're losing market shares in Asia. So just one of the effects of the current the effects of the current administration of policy carried out by the Trump administration. I, I think if you look at the United States government and include uh, Congress as well, I think you find many, many Republicans that are really uh, feeling awkward today because they are not really uh, supporting uh, the policies of the, of the present president. They say they, they maybe they're forced into doing it, but they are really free traders, and many of them anyway. So I think that they and, and many others, I think, within the large frame of the US government are feeling very confused. And I haven't seen any, anyone commenting or, or saying anything about the SPA between EU and Japan. But I would think that the president, my guess is that the US president would sneer at it somehow and, and say that, well, yeah, but the important thing is how we deal with it in concrete terms, or something like that. And so there's a feeling, I think, of alienization, if I don't know if you call it that way, within many in, in the American circles. Uh, and this is, of course, not, not very good, not good at all. It's, it's quite dangerous, I think. Uh, Rumor has it that there have been some very discreet and quiet sounding out on the, on the American side in Tokyo to see whether possibly one could try to uh, find uh, avenues for the uh, United States participation. I don't know what but the ambassador said in the comments on that. You, you mean on the trade? Yes. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's uh, that's well, there's no element to take into note, uh, to take note of, and that, that is, of course, the midterm elections that have uh, shifted the power balance in, between the Republicans and Democrats in the Congress. <coughs> the Congress is a uh, heavyweight when it comes to trade agreements. Uh, just to give you one one example, um, the UK has floated the idea that if we are not a member of customs union, etc., and uh, we can strike our own trade agreements uh, across the globe, you may you may debate, you know, the optimism, but you have seen immediately Congress people raising their voices with Irish background saying. We will not support the free trade agreement with the UK if that means that this harsh border will come down between Northern Ireland and Ireland. So this is just an example about the increasing role of Congress after midterm elections. So I would assume, I haven't seen any concrete comments on the SBA either, but I would assume that Congress would want to have more of a say and may want to try to counter some of the negative effects of the uh, of the Trump administration's current policy. And as I was saying, if I'm not a specialist, but I think, uh, at least from what I read, the uh, U US is losing market shares in Asia because as a result of its uh, trade policies. And that, in the end, will sink in, I think. Marie, any comments? Or should no, I, 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 I just wanted to say uh, that in the CPP, I believe it, it's open for the US. If they want to join Japan, they have to, I think. So that is still on, ongoing, but I also think that Japan, very polite towards Europe, and we have those new agreements, but at the same time when it comes to development cooperation now and the new rules of how to calculate which they will land, uh, launch at the G20 summit, they will uh, meet with China during the spring and try to work something out together. So if they are not, do not have the US there, they will go to to China, I think. At the same time, both uh, Japan and the EU are actually dependent on the US in security terms, no doubt. And even if the EU has no army or so forth, I mean, they, they work bilaterally with UK and France. Also, they work with NATO. They have an ambassador to NATO in Brussels. And in Japan, of course, they they listen to the U.S. when it comes to security issues. They have a mutual security agreement. Uh, I have a question. Um, the uh, SBA, let's suppose that the uh, Jack Japan is attacked by a neighbor, okay? Uh, and then I add on, Europe is attacked by a neighbor. Yeah. So what can the SBA do? 
nothing. Nothing. Okay. So when you talk about the binding, binding agreement, what does it mean? I mean, it's, it, it, it's international law in that case that, that applies, uh, and not this SPA. It doesn't the SPA doesn't have any uh, mechanism for solving uh, hard conflicts. Uh, but the ambassador was talking about crisis management no? in, in, in your talk. You say that the SPA includes yeah, but, crisis management. But, but so it doesn't mean that we will come to each other's rescue. That doesn't no, mean that. It's not an alliance structure. It's, yeah. uh, it's, it's much milder. Uh, in effect, the no. I think here the important actor is the United States, which has, through its strategic guidance, that uh, sort of provides a framework for, for Japanese defense policy, has provided Japan with more leeway when it comes to taking on uh, um, a broader defense, regional defense role in Asia. So this is where the this is where the essential relationship is uh, between the United States. As was pointed out, the United States and Japan, and the U.S. is the security guarantor of the Second World War in Asia, uh, as it is with Europe. There's, so this is a pivotal uh, actor. Um, although one should recall. Uh, that, as I was mentioned previously, that the United Kingdom and France are Pacific Maritime uh, actors, and they operate in, in the South China Sea. They operate in this area. So, uh, without uh, exaggerating their importance, it should be taken. One should take notice in talking about the European Union that they have individual member states that play have a hard military role in Asia. One and a half member. Considering the Brexit agreement, well, it why does it work out? <laughs> the functional ties will remain yeah. in that area. Other questions? Yes. Um, my name is Moshi Karama. I'm a student of um, political in Institute of Political Studies in France. And um, the, my question is, how can the EU make sure that all its member states are going to? Um, follow this framework with Japan, since there are many problems, cultural problems, economical problems within the European Union among member states. Especially, I would say, like um, there's a um, there's a line between the West and the Eastern parts, since uh, we are not exactly sharing this the exact values, and it's just generating more and more problems. So, what are the ways that the EU can make sure that all member states are following this uh, framework, this um, agreement with Japan? Who wants to take a stab at a fundamental <laughs> question about European integration? <laughs> well, in terms of trade, uh, the Commission has competencies and the European Union has competencies. It strikes it. It's the authority within the European Union that, that make the agreements on behalf of member states. It's a federal uh, function. And this is, of course, a very important element to the agreement between Japan and the European Union. Then all the shades in terms of applying the values internally. That's of course too difficult to regulate in, in detail. Mm -hmm. uh, but there are some elements, as I was mentioning initially, capital punishment. All the member states of the European Union would agree that this is not uh, in accordance with human rights. Uh, I think here, when it comes to data protection, trade, uh, here there is a the European Union has strong have agreements and structures that tie the member states to common policies. Isn't it so that, that in order to be a member of the European Union, you have to agree on shared values? And even though there's the are thing that at the moment, even I don't think that there's a complete agreement within member states. And like case of my country, Hungary, um, we are. Uh, pushing the boundaries further and further with the EU, but it seems that there are no sanctions again against it. Like the EU is seems, um, I wouldn't say incapable of acting back towards Hungary, but it's not a very efficient way of um, of regulating within the EU. It's true. But the EU has uh, is good at regulating conditions for entering the European Union, but it's waking up to the need to develop regulation for sanctioning member states. Uh, there's, a, when, there's a case in the European yeah, Court of Justice, yeah. which may have hit Hungary. Yeah. 
So, so European Union is sort of inventing the instruments. But you have to spread a very careful path here in order not to sort of polarize even more opinions within the United States to strike the right deal, the balance between pursuing uh, your values without sort of offending the sense of sovereignty of, men, of the citizens in the, in the country. It's, it's, it's tough. There's also the uh, possibility that the European Union is looking into conditionality in, in, uh, in, uh, offer, in offering structural funds to uh, the member states in Central and Eastern Europe uh, as, a, as a sort of soft, long-term instrument for, for sanctioning uh, your adherence to rule of law, common migration policy, etc., etc. It should be a factor when the European Union decide on how to uh, how to um, disperse these funds, and they correspond to 30% uh, of the budget. So it's about the money. And the countries in Central and Eastern European Union are the main benefic beneficiaries of these funds. So the European Union is inventing inventing its instrument. It's a new situ situation. So we're holding the weekly allowance. That's Sorry. The we're holding the weekly allowance. The yeah. same as I do with my kids. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, uh, but I, I think it's, it's an important uh, factor and I, actually we talk about all this and a lot of the problems is actually internal. Mm -hmm. I mean Europe needs, uh, according to my view, Europe needs to get its act together and decide what it wants to do uh, before we can become an effective international actor. But that of course is a different debate. Mm -hmm. Anyone? But, uh, as for the SBA, the, the, as was pointed out, the, all the individual parliaments have to ratify the SBA before it uh, goes into effect. But once it has been ratified, it, they have, all the members then have hopefully underlined that they agree upon uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the, the atmosphere or the, 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 I have to, of the agreement. <laughs> and that is probably also why the language is so vague. We want everyone on board, and after that, yeah. more yeah. hope is a good thing. I just hope we don't hope too much. Any other answer question? Or are you all heading heading home? <laughs> well, in that uh, case, I would like to thank the an ambassador, the panelists. For four very excellent uh, presentations, and uh, I'm actually I think this is you know extremely interesting because this is we had a Canada, we had a cooperation with Korea. This is probably one of the most extensive cooperations we're doing, and I am uh, in the light of what all goes around in the world today. I, I think this is uh, interesting. Unfortunately, I do share the a bit of the question marks that have been raised here, but also by the audience saying. Well, how do we do concrete terms? How do we control this? And this is, I think, an evolving issue. And I think we will have, well, on the 3rd of April, the next uh, discussion will help in the Stockholm School of Economics. But I think we will have the opportunity to s come back to this topic, you know, over the years to come. So thank you very much for your contributions. Thank you.